There we go. Okay. So welcome again, everyone, to this evening's 4 plus 1 Pathway Info Session. I'm Amanda Dye from Beyond Barnard. I am super excited to introduce my colleague, Claire Norton, from the Mailman School of Public Health, um, who's going to start off a, the presentation today. We're joined by Claire and some other members of the, the team at Mailman, including folks from admissions. Um, we have uh, Brian Mayu, who is one of our faculty members here at Barnard, who liaises with the program. And we're really excited uh, to welcome Dr. Cataluzzi um to to today's session as well barnard's new chief health officer and faculty in the four plus one or in sorry at mailman um so with no further ado claire i'm going to hand it over to you um i'll be here to help monitor questions so if you've got questions you can pop them into the chat and we'll come back to them at the end um we'll also have time Hello. for q a again as well great so welcome everyone i'm really excited to see so many of you here virtually um, as uh, Amanda shared, my name is Claire Norton. I'm the uh, Associate Dean for Enrollment at the Mailman School of Public Health um, and have been involved with the uh, 4 plus 1 program from its inception at Barnard and really excited to have an opportunity um, to talk with you all about that opportunity tonight. Um, so now the question is, why am I screen not forwarding? There we go. Um, so uh, what is public health? Now, this is a question that we used to feel far more compelled to need to answer than we do these days when everyone is a lot more uh, familiar uh, with public health. But, um, you know, public health is really about protecting and improving the health of populations. And that's through a, a variety of um, actions, right? Via education and promotion of healthy lifestyles, research, um, things along those lines. Uh, and the Columbia Mailman School um, currently educates about 1,600 students um, across six departments um, and five degree programs. So um, we, in addition to the MPH, which we are talking about tonight, we do also have a master's in health administration, a master's in science, um, a doctor in public health, and um, a PhD program as well. Um, but uh, our six departments, um, are all uh, part of our four plus one program. So to give you just a little um, insight into those, right? Biostatistics, um, our department is actually the first in the nation. Um, and biostatistics is um, really uh, sort of an evolving uh, area around um, collection and ana analysis of massive data sets, right? And, and so this sort of data, this era of big data Right, has uh, created an opportunity for us to think about how we quantify evidence and enable prediction based on, on large scales of information and our biostatistics department um, does work in that, in that area. Um, environmental health sciences um, is uh, focused around um, tackling issues in the fields of epigenetics, exposure science, toxicology, climate and health, um, so things like how um, cancer and asthma might be um, impacted by our environment, as well as environmental policy. Um, our epi department um, studies patterns and causes of illness and injury. Um, obviously, the whole world has heard a lot about epidemiology in the past two years, but um, it's not all infectious disease, um, right? There's also a study of chronic disease. Um, and our chair of our epidemiology department is um, actually focused on gun violence as an epidemic. Uh, so um, there's a lot of really interesting ways that epidemiologists look at population health. Um, health policy and management uh, may be the most obviously named department, right? Focuses on development, implementation, and evaluation of um, health policies and administrative functioning of health systems. Um, New York City is a really, really interesting place to study health policy and management because of the multitude of health systems um, that exist here in New York. Um, population and Family Health, which is Dr. Catalozzi's department, um, looks at legal policy and human rights dimensions of health, um, particularly in low-income, unstable, and inequitable environments. Um, so they focus on areas like reproductive health, sexual health, migrant populations, and adolescent health. And then our sociomedical sciences department uh, is dedicated to understanding the social forces that influence health. So 
Um, they focus on things like how health and policy outcomes are influenced by race and gender, ethnicity, sexuality, socioeconomic status, um, social conditions. So, um, you know, things like poverty and incarceration, right? What are the, the implement, uh, implications for public health? So we are gonna talk about our Columbia four plus one MPH degree program um, in this session. And so what that looks like um, is that in the fall of your senior year, which is the light blue, uh, you spend that fall taking coursework at uh, the Mailman School of Public Health. Um, some Barnard students are also taking um, a couple of courses uh, at Barnard during that time, particularly um, things related to your thesis coursework. So students are taking anywhere um, at Barnard, usually from 10 and a half to 15 credits at Mailman. Um, and again, maybe a few additional credits at Barnard. Um, and determining which of those tracks is the fit for you is something that you'll do with your Barnard faculty. Um, then in the spring of your senior year, you return to Barnard uh, to complete your undergraduate degree. Then in that subsequent year, um, you enroll in the remainder of your um, MPH program and um, the orange-ish color that or yellowy orange color you see there that says discipline um, is one of those departments I just was talking about. So that's where you'll do, um, you know, the primary focus of your coursework. Um, but you will also take leadership and integration of science and practice, which are two other parts of our core curriculum and we'll talk about our core curriculum in just a moment. Um, and then you'll have an opportunity to engage in a practicum, which is field work, an opportunity to, to put into practice the things that you're learning in the classroom. So um, in the um, year four, you remain a Barnard student. You're sort of just cross-registered with us. Um, in that plus one year, you become a student at uh, Columbia Public Health. Um, so um, if you attend today's session and say, gosh, given my um, requirements at Barnard, uh, the four plus one is not going to be the right thing for me, but you're still interested in an MPH. I just wanted you to have a sense of what the MPH degree program looks like. Otherwise, um, pretty similar uh, in the first year students engage in our core curriculum um, and begin to take that integration of science and practice, um, which you would take in the four plus one in your plus one year. Um, and then in their second semester, start to take, start to take courses in their discipline, um, engage in their practicum in sort of the midst of the program. And in addition to their discipline, also um, complete a certificate. So we have 23 certificate programs um, that allow students to either uh, get sort of a deeper dive into their discipline or to... combine areas of interest. So uh, actual and reproductive health um, certificate uh, for many years. Um, and students sometimes take that um, because they're already in a department like population and family health, but sometimes they might be in um, health policy and management or um, epidemiology, but want to think about things um, through a particular lens. So um, that's a benefit of our, of our two-year full-time program is you get also that New York State certified certificate in addition to your MPH degree. Okay, so let's talk about the MPH core. Um, and um, I'm gonna let Dr. Catalozzi jump in here a bit because she actually teaches or has taught for many years in our core and uh, starts to teach this year, I think tomorrow. Um, so um, what you're looking at here are the six studios of our uh, core curriculum. Um, so those are foundation, foundations of public health, research methods and applications determinants of health, public health interventions, global and developmental perspectives, and health systems. Um, and what I like about the way that this um, slide presents is that what you can see is not each of these is worth the same number of credits. And um, because of that, they're also not the same amount of time throughout the semester. So each of them is made up of these different concentrations of which there are a total of 16 across the core. Um, and the curriculum throughout really threads through. Um, it's really connected, what you're learning in, in each of these studios. But, um, you know, some of them run almost the full length of the term, something like research methods, which we call REMA. Um, whereas Foundations of Public Health, for instance, starts at the beginning. And um, uh, some of the other courses, like um, Health Systems, start a little bit later. 
right? So, um, so it's not like your typical undergraduate experience, maybe where you're taking the same course from, you know, nine to 11 every Tuesday and Thursday, right? It's a very integrated curriculum. What you're, what you're taking each week is changing. Um, you know, it's a, it's a full day and it's a full commitment. And so it's what makes, um, it kind of complicated for students to need to take a lot of credits outside of the core um, is the is the way that it's designed and the timing of it. So that's why you'll really want to um, work closely with your faculty advisors to understand um, what you still need to do at Barnard and to make sure um, that this is fit within your um, Barnard requirements. Because of course, your first um, you know and sort of foremost uh, important thing is to make sure that you're finishing your undergraduate degree. Um, so, you know, this is a, a great add on um, if it if it fits. Um, and I'm going to sort of punt to Dr. Catalozzi and let her say a little bit more about um, how the uh, curriculum within the MPH core uh, really works. Uh, thanks so much, Clara. So uh, combining two of my uh, favorite things, which is the School of Public Health um, and, and working with students there and then um, being uh, new at Barnard as the Chief Health Officer, um, I will say that uh, I've uh, been trying to be involved in the four plus one with Barnard and actually have two of the um, advise, advisees in POPFAM this year. I also direct the General Public Health Program and be and, and very attuned to accelerated and dual degree students. Um, and and have to say that we really work very hard um, to make sure that all the students who are doing um, uh, doing the MPH a little bit differently get into the same cohort um, at uh, the School of Public Health, which is really helpful because then you're with other students who are either doing it in a year or doing it in a little bit of a different fashion than the full uh, two years. And I think um, having uh, colleagues who, who have that also brings you just some new experiences. A lot of them have been in the workforce for a while and you're able to network in that way um, uh, as well. Um, so the core, I think, is uh, I've been with the core since its inception, and I actually teach in the red part at the very bottom, that little tiny qualitative foundations piece. I'm a qualitative researcher. And then um, for years also taught in determinants of health with biologic basis of public health. And I think one of the most um, really beautiful things is it really gives everyone a really strong basis. And particularly when you're doing this in an accelerated fashion um, or doing it a little bit differently, it's really wonderful to feel Feel that you have an intercalated uh, curriculum that is bringing you aspects of, of what you probably would want to take in every department anyway, um, so that when you leave the core, you have a good sense of, okay, now where do I want to focus because I got this really wonderful foundation. Um, and these foundational courses also expose you to many faculty in the department who um, have either deep experience in public health or deep experience in the education of public health um, so that you can connect with them, uh, learn a little bit more about you know, what they do or what, what's happening in their departments um, and get thinking about, okay, well, what other courses would I wanna take? Or maybe I would reach out to this person um, even to be able to start thinking about my practicum. Uh, so uh, just, you, just the exposure is so wonderful. So everything from the basics of, you know, what do I really need to know in terms of uh, epidemiology and some of the basic biostatistics that I would have to do, uh, whether or not statistics is going to be the focus of what I um, uh, look at, to really the foundations and history of public health um, with a big focus on um, uh, the, the issues of race, um, of intersectionality that are really so critical um, in all of what we talk about in public health now. Um, so again, uh, it's a really committed faculty. I think students really get immersed and it's also a chance for you um, uh, to hone in their large classes, but you also have smaller group classes, uh, integration of science and practice, leadership classes that really go through the whole year that allow you to um, build really a strong foundation, not only with um, senior students who act as TAs, but your colleagues, and then of course faculty uh, who get to know the students really well. Um, I think it's really um, the signature piece of our MPH and really sets us apart in terms of a lot of the other uh, MPH programs um, in the country. And a lot of people, um, whether or not this is going to be your terminal degree or you're going to go on to something else, a lot of people have asked me like, you know, what's the point at which you think you should get an MPH? You should get an MPH whenever you have uh, the time and interest to do it. Um, and in many ways, um, again, your, your um, 
uh, treated as an accelerated student. And uh, when I look at the accelerated uh, students who are coming in, um, they need two to five years of experience, um, you know, take the GREs, et cetera. So the idea that you could put this together with your undergraduate uh, degree is really powerful. Um, and uh, I think can uh, make a big difference in the way that you kind of frame um, the rest of your career trajectory. Um, so so uh, if anyone has questions or wants to talk about it, otherwise I'm completely um, available to do that. Um, and I also think um, speaking to people who have gone through the pro program would probably be helpful as well and happy to connect you with any of those folks as well. Yes, and we have Barnard 4 plus 1 students who are acting as TAs um, in the core. Um, so, uh, so they have that perspective as well. So yeah, just to, to add, you know, I think um, to me what's so interesting about uh, this core curriculum that you experience is that I think, you know, so often in our education we're taught things in that like, you know, maybe intro to epidemiology, intro to biostatistics, intro to, you know, um, behavioral um, science, whatever. And um, in this case, right, you have faculty from across departments teaching what we think of as a school as one course together, really, you know, um, tying together that, that uh, curriculum in that particular studio. So, um, and then all six studios work together as well. So, um, so I think it's the, likely the most integrated learning experience um, that, that most uh, folks ever have a chance to participate in in their lives. And it's certainly rigorous um, and challenging. Uh, and I think there are moments during it where folks think to themselves like, wow, this is complicated. Um, but almost everyone at the end feels like it was such an amazing experience and, and really the right way to put it together. So it's, it's something we're quite proud of. And in fact, um, the, you know, uh, the accrediting body for the accrediting body for schools of public health really used the outcomes that the Mailman School developed um, in this core curriculum now to evaluate the educational um, outcomes required for all schools of public health. So um, it's really a very innovative approach to education. So in addition to those um, studios, you will then engage in this leadership course, um, which really is about developing those, you know, practical skills because a, a real goal of a master's in public health um, from our perspective is to develop leaders in public health. Um, and so we wanted to make sure that students felt that they were um, leaving the program not only um, with, you know, those, those great skills um, from within their department, but that they also had thought about how to lead change in public health. Um, and then, um, as you heard, we also have a course called Integration of Science and Practice, which is part of our core curriculum, um, which for four plus one students occur in your plus one year. Um, and it is um, an opportunity to engage in case-based learning and really bring together all of the different things that you're learning in the core. And again, what um, is somewhat unique, I think, about this, this course and also our core curriculum is because of the way that it's designed, we're deliberately bringing together students from across the different departments, the different disciplines. Um, so you will be sitting in a group of 20, um, having conversations about a variety of different issues. You see here that one case was about, um, you know, trans fats in New York City. Um, and, um, and you have students in your class who are studying biostatistics and who are studying epi epidemiology and who are studying environmental health and who are studying health policy and um, population and family health and sociomedical sciences and who have all different you know, levels of experience um, and they're bringing that to this conversation and um, it's really designed to bring, you know, to synthesize the skills that you're learning across those um, six different studios. So it's everybody's favorite course. Um, I think Dr. Catalozzi, you've taught ISP too, right? Once upon a time, yes. <laughs> Um, and, you know, you get to know that faculty member incredibly well. I remember that when I first started working um, at Mailman, I was so surprised to discover that, like, at the end of the term, all the ISPs were having these, like, celebratory get-togethers and whatever, and I was like, really? You're having all your students over to your house or whatever, right? They were all doing all these things, and it's because they become um, really very close, and the folks that are in that class are also your learning group throughout your um experience at the school. So um, I find that that even our alum will talk about how they go back to that group 
um, for many, many years to come um, for feedback and ideas and, um, you know, to, to help them throughout their public health careers. So it's a really a foundational opportunity. Um, so this gives you again, like just a little snapshot of what are some of the kinds of courses that then you'd take in these different departments um, if you were to select a given department. Um, so in addition to our core curriculum, right, then each department has a department core and department um, electives. So not dissimilar uh, probably to your undergraduate experience in that regard. Um, and so, you know, you'll want to do some research about which of these areas seems uh, like it's the best fit for you um, within the field of public health. So then, as I mentioned, there is a field practice experience. Um, we have an office of field practice and also in every department, um, there are sort of point people and faculty who are very connected to lots of organizations. Um, so although field um, practice or a practicum is a requirement of the degree, right? It's not really on the student to somehow figure out how to make that happen, right? This is something that we really facilitate on behalf of students, um, you know, along with um, your interests and, and what it is that you're desiring to get out of the experience. So um, for lots of students, this is an opportunity to say, I think I might be interested in, let me try that out, right? And see if it's a fit. Um, you know, uh, for others, um, it's just a way to get an additional piece of experience that they know they want to have, even though they don't think that that is necessarily the direction that they're interested in going for their career. Um, there's the opportunity to do them domestically, also to do them internationally. Um, so um, it's a really uh, wonderful, you know, opportunity to see how the things you're learning in the classroom um, are then put to, to work in the real world. Um, and there are outcomes required of that, and there's some, you know, um, work you have to do that you, you give back to the school. Um, but again, it's something that's really very, very well facilitated by us and, and a great part of the experience. Um, we also um, have students engage in something called interprofessional education, um, which in our case is um, particularly wonderful because the School of Public Health at Columbia is located at the Columbia Medical Center. So um, you all are obviously right across from the Morningside campus, but um, we are up on 168th Street and Broadway. Um, and uh, so that campus includes not only the School of Public Health, but the School of Physicians and Surgeons, um, the School of Nursing, the Dental School, um, Occupational Therapy, um, Physical Therapy. So you have it on nutrition. So you have an opportunity to interface in this educational experience. Um, with students from across the medical center who are learning about health professions from a variety of different lenses, right? And so, um, you know, this gives us a chance to understand the clinical perspective on some issues and to bring the population health perspective um, on those same issues. Um, and it's, so it's a really great opportunity and, a, and is part of um, what all students do um, as well during their education. So there's chance to do it in some one day events that we have. There's opportunities to participate in um, kind of a week long version during the semester. So um, people opt into different versions of this that they think will be most interesting, but um, it's really a great way to be sure that you're thinking about um, all those different lenses that impact health. Um, there's also a great deal of student life at the um, School of Public Health. Um, more than 25 active organizations that are everything from, um, you know, pro professional organizations to affinity type groups, um, groups that are working um, within our neighborhood, um, and then also lots of activities happening um, on campus. You can hear, you know, a talk almost every day of the week, not only from School of Public Health faculty, but from faculty um, at all those other parts of the medical center as well. Um, we have an amazing Office of Diversity, Culture, and Inclusion that runs um, something called social, uh, self-social and global awareness that's part of our um, core curriculum and um, is an opportunity for uh, us uh, sort of to start to build our culture as a community and really um, recognize um, the value uh, that all the, the differences um, in our community can bring. Um, 
In terms of housing, there's housing up at the medical center, but while you are four plus one students, um, if you're living in Barnard housing, you'll stay in Barnard housing. Um, you're still a Barnard student. Um, so uh, our housing becomes an option in that plus one year. Um, and you know our, our students are incredibly active. Um, we had a, a large group of students who went to um, the Supreme Court on Monday to, to protest. Um, there. And um, again, Dr. Catalozzi ran an amazing um, group during COVID, which maybe you want to say a little something about um, the core, service core. Yeah. So, um, and actually, I think um, during NSOP, um, uh, the CSSC or COVID Student Service Core um, came, we are a service learning core uh, that has involved uh, not only COIMC schools, but also undergraduate. And we've had a, a few Barnard students who've been involved and would uh, love to have people uh, continue to be involved. But basically when everything went remote, including clinical students, um, it was really supporting our hospital system uh, through remote patient monitoring, for example, making calls to postpartum um, uh, folks who uh, had to leave the hospital sooner because of the risk of COVID and so checking on them and their newborns and escalating care if needed. Um, we connected our um, NICU families with their babies because only one parent could go in. Um, really uh, substantive work, some of it which continues, um, uh, patient uh, companionship uh, through iPads and now um, people starting to do that in person again. We also supported the frontline workers through um, raising money for um, uh, meals for frontline workers, particularly in some of the health and hospital systems that um, didn't have the same amount of funding as some of the private hospitals. And then we turned to um, helping with um, uh, folks who were um, protesting, um, particularly around um, uh, you know, the issues around race after George Floyd's death because people needed masks and didn't have them. And so we raised funding and brought masks to protesters. Um, and then we did some more support in the community, which continues. So um, getting diapers for um, children who whose families really just didn't have the funding to do so because um, they maybe had lost jobs or could could, had, to, could, had to leave the workforce, tutoring for kids in our community um, virtually, and some of that still continues. Um, so again, uh, one of the things that we saw was that we've had over 2,500 volunteers and three quarters were mailman students. So really students who not just were in the core, but um, led. Um, so a lot of the leadership came from, you know, folks who have that systems thinking approach um, and really being able to apply public health in action through service learning, which is so much of what we do at Mailman in general, um, and being able to put that into action during a time when it was really needed was really um, critical. So again, um, and, uh, you can get involved while you're at Barnard, but also um, having that public health perspective really um, helpful in that way. And we're so, so grateful to all the students who've, who continue to be involved. Thousands of students from our campus. So yeah, it was really a, an amazing initiative. Um, so what happens when people have an MPH? So um, in uh, our last, our graduating class of May 2020, because we haven't had quite enough time, we, we collect data up to six months thereafter. So we don't know about our 2021 graduates yet, but right. So these folks graduated into a pandemic at a time when um, employment rates were as low as they had been in quite a while. And um, only three and a half percent of students were still looking for jobs. These are all public health jobs, right? Um, so these are full-time public health roles that folks are in, or um, some obviously always continue education into PhD and DRPH programs and things along those lines. Um, so we have a really incredible um, career services team that's dedicated to the School of Public Health that offers career services for life um, to anyone who's ever been a student at the Mailman School of Public Health, um, and they do remarkable work. Um, what do folks tend to go into? So this gives you a bit of a sense of how that tends to distribute. So um, you see that hospitals and health um, systems are a big one, as is government, consulting, um, universities, nonprofits. Um, but lots of other areas as well, things like pharma and biotech research um, technology. Um, and the job functions within that tend to be, um, you know, researching statistician epidemiology, um, management and administration and program management, um, but lots of other areas as well. You see that there's a, not an insubstantial number of folks who are clinical um, and getting their MPH for that to go together. Um, lots of different areas there. This is... Um, just a sampling of employers that students from that most recent graduating class are working with. Um, 
So you see that there's, you know, again, sort of global health and NGO and humanitarian and government and hospitals and health systems and philanthropy and nonprofits and research and consulting and um, technology startups. Um, we have um, students working um, in places like Apple um, because Apple watches are now create, you know, creating a scenario where there's such um, health data, right? That there's opportunities to think about how to influence population health that way. So, um, so really a, a you know, phenomenal array. Um, we have uh, a career fair coming up um, in a few weeks time and um, we have about a hundred employers that are coming to that. So, um, so we, again, we really have, have deep connections and folks working all across the world. So we have alumni in, in pretty much any area. So if you're thinking to yourself, you know, well, that's nice, but I, you know, I'm from Seattle and I want to go back there or I'm from wherever, right? We, we have alumni there and our um, career services team has great connections. Um, okay, so if you're now convinced that this all seems like something that's going to be a great fit for you and something that you want to do, what are the steps? So um, you'll want to talk to uh, Beyond Barnard and uh, your faculty advisor um, about planning for this. Um, you can be studying anything. Um, everything is good preparation for public health. We're um, celebrating our centennial this year. And um, one of our slogans for the centennial celebration is public health is everything. Um, because truly, uh, the more you learn about public health, the more that you understand that um, most anything that's happening um, in the world is influenced um, by, you know, structures that are there to support public health or lack thereof. Uh, and so, you know, any, any area of study is good preparation. We are looking for students to have a college math course. Um, your Barnard faculty typically are looking for calculus um, when they're doing their review. If you're interested in biostatistics, you'll need a full year's worth of calculus. Um, and if you're interested in environmental health, they prefer you to have some um, lab science, particularly bio and chemistry. Um, we are looking for students in the four plus one program with GPAs of 3.5. Um, or better. Uh, and that's, again, because that's an accelerated program. So we're really looking for students who are going to be able to move quickly through um, this curriculum. Um, so uh, you will apply uh, this fall if you're a junior um, or in the fall of your junior year when that sh comes along. Um, and the application includes um, a 500 word personal statement where we're really looking for students to talk about um, why public health um, and why the discipline that they're selecting, right? So what is it about um, the area that you think you wanna study that you feel is really a good fit for you? Um, like I got a friend on stage presence like, hey, my friend got 40 inch hair. Babe. I'm sorry, is that a question for us? Um, okay, someone just maybe accidentally came unmuted. No worries. Um, okay, and then letters of recommendation, um, two of which we would ask to have from faculty. And one of those can be also that you at Barnard, you do a um, sort of internal form um, with a major advisor to talk about what it would look like for you to be in a program like this. And so um, we use the same information that they sort of put together there as um, part of this. Um, and although we require it, as you heard earlier, typically um, for students applying to our MPH program, there's no standardized test scores required for this. Um, we do um, get a copy of your official transcript and we work with Barnard um, on that. And um, we would love for you, regardless of whether you think the four plus one or some other program might be of interest to consider um, learning more, you can, um, plan a one-on-one -on -one meeting with someone from our admissions or financial aid team to understand more about that, um, attend um, our upcoming open houses um, and other events to learn more about our departments and the experience at the Millman School of Public Health, um, lots of different workshops and things. Um, I did wanna, I thought I had a, an additional slide in here, so I'm gonna go backwards just to sort of clarify um, how, how does it work really to be a four plus one student? So in the, um, senior year, you are a Barnard student paying Barnard tuition. Um, in your plus one year, you are a Mailman School of Public Health student paying 
mailman four plus one tuition. So at this time, um, that tuition is roughly sixty thousand dollars, right? So in your in your mailman year, um, you pay us about sixty thousand dollars in tuition, um, and that is to complete the rest of your um, MPH, the coursework that's required after your core curriculum, um, which you complete during your senior year. Um, the total number of credits required for this program is 45. Um, so you do you know, anywhere from 10 to 15 in that fall of senior year and you do the balance um, with us again over the um, sort of fall, spring, summer of that subsequent year. Um, there are some academic departments that require courses in that um, final summer, for instance, epidemiology, um, students will need to take um, an epi course, epi three in that summer um, because you won't have had an opportunity to take your departmental courses um, until then. And because they um, sort of layer one after the other, um, you have to take that course at that time. So not everyone will necessarily have coursework remaining um, in that first summer term, uh, but typically um, regardless, students in the four plus one are taking, are completing their practicum requirement in that final summer. And so um, degrees are conferred for this program in October. Um, and that I think is a, a bit of an overview. So um, we are going to, um, yes, yeah, sorry, Amanda. I, I yes, okay. thank you for clarifying on the calculus. Um, and it uh, doesn't seem, I don't see anything yet in the chat, but I, welcome you either to just go ahead and unmute and ask a question if you have one. Looks like Lila um, has something to ask. I am a transfer student and I just transferred in this year as a junior. And I was wondering two things. The first is, as for the letters of recommendation, um, should the two faculty letters of recommendation still be from Barnard or would I be able to use one from my old institution? Um, yeah, they don't have to be from Barnard. I mean, for everyone, they wouldn't necessarily have to be from Barnard. If you had taken coursework um, somewhere else and you had a different faculty member that you wanted to reference, um, you absolutely could do that. Um, again, you'll want to speak to your faculty advisor about whether um, something like this is a fit. You know, there are special requirements for students who transfer about how many credits have to be done um, in residence at your new institution and things like that. So whether or not um, the four plus one will fit with your academic plan is something that you're going to want to confirm, um, you know, with with folks at Barnard. Okay, thank you. Um, Lucy, Lucia? Hi, yes, thank you. Um, I was hoping you could explain a little bit more about the significance of a certificate and what we would perhaps be missing by not doing the um, traditional two year path. Sure, and actually, I'm going to let um, Dr. Catalosi share her perspectives on that since she has um, been running uh, one of our certificates for many years. Well, I've co-led the Sexuality Sexual Reproductive Health Certificate and um, the idea behind, not every school does certificates. So you have your department and then it allows you to sort of, um, you know, specialize, kind of take certain courses uh, for SSRH, for example, we only have two required courses, but then there are many courses that are of interest. And so what, what, um, what we do in our certificate and in most certificates, if you know you have an interest, so let's say you were interested in SSRH or um, in, uh, you know, aging, you know, we've had accelerated students who've been interested in both. Um, there usually is a listserv or a mailing list and you can still attend any of the um, special events. So talks that happen, et cetera. Um, and then the other piece is what's the coursework and you can still always take the courses. And what we try to do again, because I've been working with general public health, um, when I know that there are students who are interested, so for example, in our cornerstone course for sexual reproductive health, it's current issues in sexuality, sexual reproductive health issues. Um, and I, we speak to the, um, to the course leader, the faculty, and also the department about accepting a certain number of students or knowing sort of when are the possibilities for accelerated students to take that course. So it's, if it's always offered, for example, um, in the fall, and you know that you're gonna be taking the core in the fall, the next fall that would be available, kind of making sure that they are aware of that student if they wanna take it. Um, so there are definitely, um, the advantages in terms of like the community and be having access as long as you let the uh, certificate 
lead no, um, they would let you do that. It would just be um, about kind of getting into the courses and again, speaking to the certificate lead who usually would have um, a connection with the faculty, et cetera. Um, again, you don't, um, you don't lose out in that uh, you still have access to that community. Um, it's just that you wouldn't have an additional certificate. And we haven't seen any of the accelerated students have problems either getting into the classes or being part of that community. Um, and in many places outside of Milman, the certificate is not necessarily something that they do. So um, when you're applying to a job, for example, they wouldn't say, oh, you didn't get a certificate in this area. Um, it's a great question. And we're, again, fortunate that the communities are, are pretty expansive um, in the way that we um, uh, roll them out. And uh, I can tell you that even today, if you wanted to be part of SSRH and aren't even part of the community, we, we often will have people who are in other schools uh, come to the events or uh, log on online as well. Great, um, Claire, I don't know if you wanted to say something else in terms yeah, of- Yeah, I mean, I only would add that I think, um, I mean, so just to sort of quantify it, right? As I mentioned, the four plus one is a, is a 45 credit program and the full-time two-year MPH is a 60 credit, up to 60 credit program. So 52 to 60 credits. Um, and so, you know, there's, so there's just an opportunity for more, right? Which sometimes students want because, um, you know, that's, that's more faculty that you've gotten to know well, that's more um, interaction with your student colleagues, right, and then this opportunity to sort of um, specialize, and again, like I said, I mean, some students, you know, say, for instance, it's, it's pretty common to be um, an epidemiology student and choose epidemiology of chronic disease, right, which is then a way to really hone in on a particular part of epi that, if you do the four plus one program, you'll, as Dr. Catalozzi said, you'll take some of those courses maybe, um, but not the full concentration, right? So, um, so it's just that, that opportunity to, to get a deeper dive into something. And again, sometimes it is in your department and, and all of you will still have some, some number of credits that you're able to take across the school. So every course you take won't be um, in your discipline. But, um, but, a, but a much higher percentage of them will be within your discipline in the accelerated program than would be the case, right? The, the fact that you have this certificate and that there are then electives both in your department and in your certificate means that there's just a little more breadth um, of, of opportunity. Um, but again, you, you're you know, in the accelerated opportunity, you're certainly um, you're hitting all the highlights, right? So, um, so both, are, both are great. And it's just a matter of sort of you know what your what your interests are and who and how you like to learn, right? Um, I think are are two of the things. Um, okay, how about uh, RT? Is that right? Yes, that's right. That's me. Great. Um, so I was meeting. I was I met with a faculty member at Barnard, and she was saying that there's a interview process at through Barnard that's a little bit different. And I was just curious to know if that happens after you submit your application in December or if that process happens before. She was saying that before they send your application to Mailman, you go through a full interview process. Yeah, so I should have said that too. It is a two-step process. So your applications are due December 1st to Barnard and your Barnard faculty will review it first um, and then make a decision about um, putting you forward as a candidate for uh, our school to review. Um, Amanda or Brian, do you wanna say anything else about the, um, the interview process at Barnard? Sure. So, so the interviews will happen after the um, after the applications are submitted. Um, a, a, not all applicants will be interviewed, um, and we will communicate with everybody once the applications are submitted about interview timing. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. That was a great question, and it reminded me to say the deadline. Um, <laughs> so, thank you, Sophie. Yeah. Hi. Um, I was just wondering. I understand that, like. If in that senior year, um, if you're doing the four plus one, you have to have all of your degree degree requirements already done. But with like credits, like if you're still like if you're not at 121 credits, can the courses you take in the four plus one count towards your 121 undergrads? Um, yeah, so again, do you, Amanda, do you want to talk about how it works at the undergrad so, level? So I believe that the, the two things are separate. So you're not going to double count the credits that you're earning at Mailman toward your Barnard degree. You can still finish coursework during your senior year. So you're not going to spend the whole senior year taking Mailman courses. 
Um, the idea is that most of your credits in the fall semester of that fourth year should be at Mailman because of the way the core curriculum works. Um, if you are pursuing a thesis, for instance, and you need to take your thesis seminar during the fall, that's totally fine. That's, you know, workable. But if you need a significant number of credits in the fall, then the four plus one might not be the best fit. However, then in the spring semester, remember, four plus one students for the most part are just coming back to their undergraduate schools in that spring term. So if there are additional courses that you need to, to kind of finish out your credits um, or finish any degree requirements that you have remaining in that last semester, you have total flexibility to do that. So, and just to clarify, Sophie, so it's, was par is part of your question though, um, about whether like you need a total of 120 credits roughly right at Barnard. So are you saying, does that mean that you need 120 and then the courses you're taking at Mailman that fall? Is that part of what you're asking? Yeah, I guess like I was okay. just kind of looking at like kind of mapping out credits and I kind of think that the, by the time I'm starting my senior year, I'd only have like 107 credits or something. So am I able to finish up those credits in that senior year or am I expected to have those done? Right. So, I mean, you will, um, again, oh. oh, do we lose Claire? I think Claire might be frozen. I thought, I think we can, you, I think you can, you're allowed to double count a few credits. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. We'll, we will, we'll clarify it, but there is some. Um, there's a little, there's a little fuzzy area in there where I think you're allowed to double count some. And, and remember that the, the spring semester, you know, if you took whatever, you know, 13 credits during that spring semester at Barnard, you'd still be able to make it to your 120 total. Okay, perfect. That totally clarifies. Thank you guys. Yeah. I think we have indeed lost Claire. Um, there's a question in the chat about the practicum that I'm happy to answer. Um, so that I can it's part of the um, Mailman education. And so um, it's really, uh, it's inclusive of your tuition. Um, there are some practica, you know, if you get if you get a paid position for a practica, that's okay also. So, um, you know, there are some internships that could be paid, et cetera, um, and that's okay. Uh, the question about the work that it's expected, there are deliverables that you have for the practicum and we, um, adhere to the CIFA requirements that's our accreditation body. So for example, let's say that you were working with, um, I had a student who was working with one of the, we have a pipeline program for um, youth in Washington Heights and Inwood. They, uh, it's a kind of preparatory health sciences, seventh through 12th grade. Um, and this person actually built a public health curriculum for them. So the curriculum itself was one of the deliverables. Um, and then they also did an evaluation of, um, you know, the process of implementing the curriculum and how it, um, you know, how the students received it, um, and also how the people who implemented the curriculum um, felt about, uh, you know, training this in this pipeline program, and that was a, a, a presentation, and then they also had a paper. So it really depends on what your project is, um, but you set out beforehand kind of your timeline, it gets approved by your advisor, as well as your uh, practicum placement person, um, and then you set out what the deliverables will be, um, and that usually there's specific C for requirement around that as well. Again, our Office of Field Practice is a really wonderful resource, um, and again, they help with placement as, as well as your um, advisor, um, other people people that you'd be working with in the school, faculty, et cetera. Um, and uh, again, the practicum is part of the education as opposed to an additional thing that you'd have to um, pay for. I think I got all that clear, but if I missed anything, let me know. Seems great. There's a question about acceptance rates for the program, Claire, in the chat. Sure. Yeah. So, um, I mean, the four plus one is really small. So I know we don't publish um, acceptance rates, but we have typically accepted the vast majority. I mean, you know, 90% plus, I think, of students that have been identified by Barnard. And, um, and typically, you know, in, in many cases, if the, if the answer is that we're not accepting a student, it's really because we've decided sort of academically between us and, and Barnard that 
it's probably not a great fit, right? So most students who get to the part of, of actually completing the application seem to be very good fits for the program, um, you know, in terms of, from our perspective, right, having uh, the, the right interests and, um, and the right, uh, you know, academic experience, et cetera. I think the, the challenge really becomes, right, uh, you know, I've found that one wonderful thing about Barnard students is that you are willing to take on a whole heck of a lot. Um, you all are expecting in your four years to get four degrees, I think, not just one degree. Um, so um, you're incredibly um, interested and, and willing to do a million things. But sometimes, um, right, the advisors are looking at that saying like, gosh, this is not going to be a, you know, you're not going to be able to do this other program that Barnard also has and your four plus one and <laughs> complete your thesis and all these different things, right? So, um, so typically that's it. And and again, I mean, we, you know, we really want to make sure that you get the most out of all these experiences, right? We want you to get the most out of your Barnard experience. We want you to get the most out of your Mailman School experience. And so we want to make sure that curricularly it's a good fit for your, you know, remaining requirements so that you're able to really take advantage of what both programs have to offer. And I would just say that Barnard um, students and alum are the best advocates for incoming students. Um, uh, we've had such wonderful experience with the uh, four plus ones who've come through the program. And uh, I know it's been, you know, only been around for a couple of years, but it's really been um, really wonderful to work with the students. And they have, a, it, again, uh, the uh, current students and the alum are, 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 are your best advocates because they've done such a wonderful job. Yes, you have a, a wonderful, wonderful reputation. Um, I think, Amanda, you can correct me. I think in terms of numbers, I think five Barnards, up to five Barnard students, I think, are accepted each year. That's a, that's pretty much the, the typical number that we've had. Yeah. Yeah. And application, numbers of applications have varied since we started yeah. this program. Other questions before we wrap up? I have Our one more quick question. I was wondering if there's any resource or any place that we can find information about students who have done the program and like reach out to them. Like, is there any way we could contact fellow Barnard students who have done the program or are currently doing it? Yes, absolutely. I mean, we don't have an available list, but at the like that it's someplace that you could look up. Um, but if you reach out to either um, Amanda or myself, um, we can ask some of the current students um, if they're, you know, willing to have a conversation. I'm sure they will be. Thank you. So uh, for those who are uh, who are juniors this year and are thinking about applying to the program, I think next steps definitely are make sure that you're working with your major advisors to really review what you've completed already, what your plans need to be for senior year so that you can think about the feasibility of you know, spending most of your time in senior fall with the core curriculum at Mailman. Um, you can uh, keep an eye out for an email that will come um, from, from Beyond Barnard with uh, just reminders about the application process. We'll send you a link to the application as well. Um, and you can let us at Beyond Barnard know if you've got logistical questions about the application process at all, but I'll, I'll send some reminders about that, which is first things first, important to check in with your advisors um, and make sure that you are you know, planning academically because we want to make sure that you know, everyone who participates in the pathway is able to finish up their degree at Barnard. That's your, that's your first job. Your main job is, is to finish the bachelor's degree. Um, so, uh, so do, do try to plan those meetings um, and, uh, and we will um, look forward to, to reviewing applications shortly. And we're all available to answer additional questions should they come up. I know sometimes you leave and then you think to yourself, you know what I should have asked? Um, same as I always leave and think, you know what I should have said? So please um, feel free to reach out to Beyond Barnard or um, to the admissions team at Mailman, uh, we're happy to, to assist. Thanks everyone so much for being here. We appreciate your questions. We appreciate your attention. Um, and uh, as Claire and I both said, you know, let us know if you've got questions. We'll help point you in the right direction. And have a good evening, everybody. Thank you, Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.